the axe is officially falling on the midday news, the tonight's late news, and also the consumer show Fair Go. The headlines are being hogged by the TV stars, the daily news reporters being made redundant, and the local programs going. After 35 years of six o'clock news bulletins, TV3's News Hub is likely to shut down operations after financial losses became too big to sustain. TVNZ is set to cut up to 68 jobs, the broadcasters announced today, amid tough economic conditions. Sunday is the last long-form current affairs show of its type. Once it goes... There will never be anything like it again. But at a much more grassroots level, we're also seeing the demise of the local free paper. Stop the presses is exactly what media company NZME is planning to do, announcing a proposal to close 14 of its community newspapers. Local papers for the chop include the Te Awamutu Courier, Bush Telegraph, Whanganui Midweek, Manawatu Guardian, Napier Courier, Hastings Leader and the Central Hawke's Bay Mail. The problems NZME would have faced and stuff faced also and, and closed a whole lot quietly in 2022-23 is that the cost of producing these papers on paper, newsprint just soared in the last year or so. So importing and using the paper went up, the printing process went up, the distribution costs went up. I'm Alexia Russell and today on The Detail, the local rag. The ones that aren't disappearing are shrinking, losing advertising dollars, missing out on eyes and revenue to the Facebook scrollers on community gossip pages. Papers like the Westport News, with reporter Alan Kuno telling RNZ's Nine to Noon that the local council's withdrawal of advertising threatens its existence. It's local democracy and, and we're worried about losing that. If, if this community loses its paper, it loses uh, the scrutiny that we apply to the council. What does a community miss out on when it loses its courier, advertiser, gazette, chronicle, post, guardian, press, bulletin, news? It's not just hard news and scrutiny, it's local events, it's profiles of people, it's death notices, sports reports, local education news, and how central government decisions will affect local people. It kind of acts as like a living history of of the district and it would be a a very, very sad thing to lose. And do local councils have a role to play in helping to keep these publications afloat? The decision to pull the advertising actually puts our tiny little paper that runs on the smell of an oily rag at risk. We're worried that this loss of revenue could mean we go the way of so many other news publications recently. These community papers used to carry all the classified ads that don't go in print anymore. They go online, they go... First they went online to sort of advertising sites like Trade Me, now they go direct on Facebook community pages. Do they advertise with you? Yes, they do, and they're pretty damn good, to be fair. It's not the job of local government to support local news, but if a council does patronise these smaller newspapers, it really helps. Later in the podcast, I'll talk to the editor of one small paper in a region that's swamped with news, but not with people or money. But first, Tim Murphy, Newsroom's co-editor and also media commentator on what's changed for the local rag and whether they have a future. And it's the usual story. Higher costs, less income from ads as social media sites take over. So the real estate companies in your little area or the car dealerships, they see other ways of getting their uh, message out, their products out, their sales out, and their own sites. They have their own effective sites that people go to direct, so it's just disintermediated. These um, newsprint products, which have got smaller and smaller over the years, they've been merged and they had sort of common editors and across several of them in different regions, fewer staff. And so in a way, the news companies have not self-sabotage, but as they cut costs last time and the time before that and the time before that, they made the product weaker, less appealing, less vital to the community. And so then that sort of gets into a spiral where people don't need it because they don't care so much. And so you end up with what is a inevitable uh, fact of our media and of community life now, and they've closed them, or they're going to close them. Let's talk about the cost to the community of this, not, not just financially. Where do people go now to find out what's happening at the local shops, at the local school, around the, around the traps? 
where they live? Probably the best ones are going to be the Facebook community pages that, you know, even in a small town has thousands of people logged in or at least registered for it. So those tend to replace. If you want to know where the market is this Sunday, if you want to know who's good for doing your um, guttering, uh, that kind of question that you might have had looking in the back of your community paper in the past, you now go there. Uh, and if you're looking for a real estate in Levin uh, now, instead of going to what was the Horofanua Chronicle, you probably just go direct to the Levin Baileys or the what you know just that kind of thing. Just use those Google search words, and it's yeah. all done for you. Yeah, so it's done mm. for you. That demand just isn't there. They're, what they'll lose, I think, is that shared space. That's you come across things, and it was always the case in newspapers or probably magazines and certainly daily newspapers. It's a menu, and you don't know what you're going there for until you turn on those pages. So you get and you get exposed more to other things and other retailers or other services actually catch your eye because they're, they're not what you expected when you went there. And so there's always a benefit there of being able to go to a place in a shared spot. It's like a a drinking hole in the Serengeti that everyone comes to one point to get their water on a Tuesday or a Thursday when they used to be delivered. So there was that shared experience and shared ability to graze and find stuff that you know maybe you weren't intent on and keep aside as well. And I guess there's that the specialty reporter, the one who knows their round is the area that they live in, and they're pulling out stories from local community boards or, you know, the forgotten pages of that council agenda and bringing things to people's attention. Obviously, that is not going to happen on what is essentially a Facebook gossip page. No, no, I've been, sorry, I've been focusing on the on the advertising and the reaching and selling of products, which is the revenue side for the, the, the newspaper businesses. But no, in terms of the journalism, absolutely right. That You know, each of these probably have one, one and a bit journalists, if they're lucky, really, apart from maybe someone processing and editing. And so they, they do attend themselves to all sorts of community things. So lots of things that happen in teams, schools, community organisations, you know, local people turning 100, uh, all those kind of just common, shared, you know, quite charming in their way experiences will miss out because you won't see those, even if... NZME puts a, a zone in the Herald site, their big home site, for, you know, something from Waihe or something from Terradale or Hastings or something. They won't appear in a way that you'd find them or you'd know to go there for them. That would be sort of a random big haystack and little needles of community news that might emerge. But again, uh, probably 30 people are losing their jobs in this, and a lot of those will be journalists or editors. So the scope of being able to get that material, like you say, um, will be less and less. Tim says that lack of local information will be very evident next year. Next year is local body election year. And so a lot of candidates, not the ones who are incumbent maybe, but on councils, but candidates for councils and boards would hope to be able to get something about what they're trying to put forward and their message out there to people, to a shared, broad audience, maybe a passive audience, if you like, rather than people actively going on Facebook or on a news site uh, looking for what those people might be up to. That's a concern shared by Central Hawke's Bay Mayor and Local Government New Zealand Rural Chair Alex Walker, speaking here on Newstalk ZB. We're particularly concerned about what this means for local democracy. If we don't have the local papers hitting the kitchen tables around our rural and provincial areas, how are we getting good engagement on candidates for elections and on the really crunchy local issues? It'll be harder. Democracy at that very basic level will be harder to get your message across. Um, it's mirrored a bit by some of the bigger media firms nationally falling over and being withdrawn uh, in that, for example, when News Hub closed, there won't be, in big election years, a poll from News Hub. So it's just one you know, of the maybe three or four major polls. And that's just a thing that... So one more thing gets removed for the political aspirants, people who benefited from that, and it goes right down to local boards, councils, even school boards and those sort of things. You had a forum. You had a chance to maybe have your say... That's just sort of like a candle being, the flame just being, you know, put out. The wax of democracy being yeah. Yeah. <laughs> crushed. Yeah. Once these things are closed, it's very hard to revive them in the places we're talking about. Mainly, I think it's regions at the moment. Probably the suburban city newspapers will be next. 
Local Government New Zealand is calling on the central government to put some money into local newspapers. Now, this comes as NZME, the company that owns News Talk ZB, proposes to cut 14 North Island-based community papers before Christmas. Local papers, I felt, always had a tie-up with local government. You know, they, they're very, very strong reporters of what your local council was doing. And now Local Government New Zealand has sort of tried to make a push for a further investment in local democracy reporting. I think we have to think carefully about what is that independent media role and the role of the local democracy reporting. That, that's why um, Local Government New Zealand are calling for um, the strengthening of that service because that's actually what's plugging the gap at the moment, putting good reporters into test challenge and report on the key issues uh, happening at the local government level. And so that's why we're pushing into that space. But even if that's successful, where does that reporting end up? Well, that's right. Um, it, it could end up on Stuff or on the Herald site or maybe even RNZ, yes. Um, but once again, you're going to have to go look for it, right? Well, because... you have to be grazing and looking across everything. You might see something there. And one of the things that that journalist in Wanganui or you know up in Kaitaia comes up with might sort of bubble to the top of a very busy news menu. So, yes, it's going to be hard to keep the profile and, and effect of that. Uh, that scheme, the local democracy reporting, has worked well. And it's got, I don't even I can't remember now, more than a dozen, but maybe 20, I'm not sure. There are 16. Journalists working in small uh, regions and, and unserved regions of cities as well, um, coming up with yeah, uh, stories that at a council level and at a community and sub-regional level. But yeah, where do you go find it? Depends on news judgment from the bigger sites. Well, it's not just news judgment now, is it? It's numbers. And I mean, if you're catering to a town that has 20,000 people in it and maybe a tiny proportion of them look at your website and they'll look at, the you know, if the word kaitaia appears... They might look at it, but how does that trump, you know, a, a lost puppy or Trump's latest thing? You know, it's it's all about the clicks now. Yeah, and so you will you, you sometimes see quirk that will somehow make you know Wairoa or Danavirk suddenly appear high up in those sites, but it's for something very unusual, usually a bit lightweight, possibly a bit sleazy, um, you know, or and that's pure clickbait way. But yes, standard things about, you know, say what's happening in the flood works, important stuff for a town that's exposed to you know sea level rise or something mm. is unlikely, and unless it's done as part of a nationwide survey story that, you know, you do touch yeah. on those, and that happens. The Buller District Council has decided to pull all of its advertising from the Westport News and publish it instead in a free weekly paper that's owned out of town but distributed here. All councils have a statutory obligation to publish their activities, so meetings and consultations and road closures and things like that. And the news has carried these for a really long time. This newspaper is 151 years old. Looking at the connection between local government again and newspapers. There's a bit of a strop going on down at Westport where the local paper says that they've been critical of the Westport Council and therefore they've withdrawn their advertising. What is going on down there? Oh, it's a bit of a perennial. Um, it's happened around the country and happened to big organisations as well where uncomfortable, awkward reporting and disclosure on things that are being done by decision makers at council or even government or government department level ends up with that organisation ostensibly reviewing its spend on advertising, but reviewing it away from whomever has been the awkward stone under the beach towel, you know. Mm. And so what's happened down there, I think, and, and this is from the Westport News viewpoint, is that they've been prodding and revealing and making uncomfortable uh, some of the decision-making process down there. So that council has said, well, we'll we've decided separately, nothing to do with that, of course, mm. that we'll take our spend to another paper. It, it, look, it's happened for years. Uh, when I was at the New Zealand Herald, we used to see the Auckland Council, Auckland City Council then, increasingly decide that it could get by without spending uh, on the kinds of ads that councils put in are often public notices, planning. Uh, these kind of things that under law they have a duty to set out there and get consultation from the public. 
uh, they would say, well, we can do it ourselves with the, in the Auckland Council, the City Council's view then it was a, a sort of an own produced paper, but others say they can do it in other means. Interestingly, I would think there'd be a case for the Office of the Auditor General to pr- perhaps have a probe down in Westland and see whether that council spending its money on a lesser or less intensively read product down there is actually performing its duty under law to reach out and be exposed to as many people as possible on planning and public notices and closures and whatever else they're doing. The law doesn't define the reach, does it? No, but I think it expects you to make every effort mm. and in a reasonable way. And if you're saying, well, we'll go to one half of the newspapers in our zone, then that's going to be, I think, open to question. But mm. But it's look, it's it's gone on for years. It's it's not a direct punishment, but it's a sort of a muscling or a pressure point to squeeze, you know, media, especially small companies that can't resist. So the local government's entreaty to have more reporters. Do you feel there's an element of hypocrisy there when local government councils themselves are not supporting their local papers? I mean, it's not their job. Well, <laughs> no, it's not their job. And, and you know, and again, on a nationwide level, there's been a lot of argument that the government, the central government of New Zealand, ought not to be spending its departmental advertising communication spend on Facebook and Google, that that should be coming back through local sites, Herald stuff, TVNZ, uh, and their papers and so on. Uh, that argument's made, but... It falls over, really. The, the responsibility ought to be, and it's in, consistent with what we were just saying, they should be advertising where people are and where people will see and read. And so I don't think it can be sort of this moral suasion that you should be helping a media company or you should be helping the local media company if it's not actually your principal purpose. Uh, they didn't advertise in the local media down there in Westland f- for kicks. They did it because it was effective and it got through what they needed. So it'll be interesting to see whether they can argue that that wasn't working anymore or whether just, you know, the underlying... It's spiteful. Yeah, mm. yeah. There's no shortage of news in the Ruapehu district. Winstone Pulp International has confirmed it will close two mills because of unsustainable power prices, costing more than 200 staff their jobs. The pulp and timber mills in Karioi and Tangiwai are big employers for communities in the Ruapehu district. The desert road will close for two months over summer. The repairs include rebuilding nearly 16 kilometres of road. While the future of Whakapapa ski field hangs in the balance. Uh, We're definitely just hanging on this year, hoping for the next snowfall. The uncertainty on the sale process of Whakapapa is going to be a massive concern for a lot of people around Well, there's a warning the world heritage status of Tongariro National Park could be threatened by people flouting Rahui in the area. Any government investment in reviving the mothballed historic Tongariro Chateau will end up costing it financially, according to advice from the Department of Conservation. The editor and owner of the weekly Ruapehu Bulletin is Robert Milne. It's quite small, about 12 pages, occasionally 16. We cover the southern Ruapehu district, so that's the towns of Wairu, Reitihi, Ohakuni uh, National Park and the rural delivery areas. It's quite a mixed area. Population maybe 4,000. I haven't actually double-checked with the latest census figures yet. That's <laughs> another story I've got to work on. It's been going since 1983. I started working for the previous owners in, I think, 84. I've been here ever since, basically. And do you own it now? We do. Yeah, my wife and I own it. We bought it in 1990. So you are the local reporter? Yes, pretty much. Wow. And normally uh, an area of about 4,000, you'd think, oh, what possible news can there be? But just in the last couple of months, the desert road between Turangi and Waiuru is going to close for two months for repairs. The the work is heartbroken as the closure of Rupehu Mills put 200 people out of a job. Um, Yeah. The ownership sure. and operation of both ski fields on Ruapehu. Yep. The d- yep. <laughs> debate over the conservation areas and charging people to walk the Tongariro Crossing. There seems to be no shortage you, of news. You've just read my list of... <laughs> 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 yeah, on, ongoing too, you know. like yeah. Often the, 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 the main media gets the, you know, they do the big rah-rah. We're, because we're weekly, we're near, you know, sod law things always happen on, on, just after we've gone to print. Mm. 
but the following week we can we can start dig a bit deeper and get some finer detail on on what's happening um just how things are going to affect people longer term and you know there's always lots of speculation on what will happen but yeah if we can get get a bit more um info about what is actually happening in fact the mills is one that i need to get back onto but just to see what's happening there's people still there there's rumors about that they might be sold and reopen but only rumors Mm. yeah what would be the effect on the community if you weren't here digging up the details well um that's a good question i think i i hate to think because the dailies are you know here less and less you know they're only here for the the main events you know they don't come and do the kids pet days and the, well, even the AM, you know, the A&P show and the rodeo and things like that. Hmm. Um, and, and definitely not council meetings and things like that. You know, I, I've always, I always try and cover every, everything that's in, in council meetings because it might sound a bit boring, it's local council, and, but it does, it affects people. You know, it might be, oh, they're going to put a new footpath on Tyne Street or whatever, you know, well, that's going to affect someone. And there'll be people saying, oh, we've been waiting 20 years for that, so it's important for them. We could just wait, and then the footpath there. But, um, yeah, I, I just think it's important that they that people are aware of all those things. Mm. Council puts out a lot of information, but to be honest, it's kind of, it, it's almost too much. It's, you know, like we try and break it up into bite-sized chunks. And, and, and rather than council news, it's Aukuni news, as in what's happening with the roads, the footpaths, the water, or Reitahi news. Are they finally going to fix the stormwater? Things like that. Yeah. Now, speaking of the council, what sort of relationship do you have with them? Do they advertise with you? Yeah, they do, and they're pretty damn good, at, to be to be fair. And this is the Rupehu District Council? It is. Yep, they are pretty good. We've we've had lots of good support in different ways. Just an exa- as an example, I don't know if you remember the very first COVID lockdown, and the government was rushing around trying to figure out how to do this, and they um, sent everyone home except media. So we thought, cool, we're going to keep going. Then they said, no, only daily newspapers. And so you know, our argument was, well we cover a lot of the detail that is, is important here. It's different to what's happening in Wanganu, which is an hour and three quarters away, and or Palmerston North, which is two hours away. So, but anyway, um, I was busy sort of putting my case together and I I got an email or CC'd from the council to, I think it was at MB back then, sorting it all out, demanding that our local papers be exempt and be allowed to keep publishing. <laughs> so it was actually, it was quite a quite an interesting little situation. Yeah, you're not the only local paper in the area. There is another one in um, based in Taumaranui, so they cover the north of the district. That's the Taumaranui Bulletin. Okay. And yeah, we work with them. He's a one man band. We cooperate reasonably well. What's your circulation figure? At the moment, it's about 3,600 papers. Quite a big number for the population, but we really try to make sure that everyone can, who wants it can get it. And when you go out in the community, which presuming you do <laughs> on a regular basis, yep. what's yep. your interaction like with the community? Are, are people still grateful to have a physical newspaper put through their letterbox? Yes. Oh, yeah. I know that because they complain when they don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so... Oh yes, for sure. People still want to know what's happening in their own street or down, you know, in the next street. Um, and I think it's even it seems to me that people want that even more with so much access to information around the world. They want that local information mm. and the local people stories. You know, they're always really popular and and good to do, fun to do. There's so many stories. That's it for today. The Detail is a newsroom production supported by RNZ and New Zealand On Air. This episode was engineered by Alex Harmer and produced by Amanda Gillies. Thanks to Tim Murphy and Robert Milne. I'm Alexia Russell. Ka kite.